All right, welcome. Yeah, so I, I went ahead and started recording here. We, we had a few questions, but um, I'll go ahead and begin recording. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, hope hope everybody that's here or listening to this later is doing okay. Uh, we continue to be battered by circumstances here. Uh, I know, you know, personally that I, I'm, I have not been able to get caught up and, and um, you know, I'd, I'd hope to maybe get ahead of some stuff, but um, for this course and other courses, I'm still I'm just barely keeping up as opposed to getting stuff kind of ready ahead of time. But, but anyway, I hope everybody's kind of getting back on track um, and didn't suffer too much. Uh, personally, I didn't have power myself through most of like Sunday, uh, late night, well, early Monday through Wednesday, Thursday. Finally, it was, it was on continuously on Thursday for me. But then at that point, I ended up losing water till about till the weekend, till Saturday at some point. Um, I know commerce might still be having problems with water from what I've heard. Uh, I finally got mine back pretty much reliably on like Saturday afternoon. So but yeah it's been kind of rough and i know it's been rough on everybody but um um but with that in mind i was kind of looking at our schedule i mean i had originally so so that we, we did kind of skip over a week i'm just considering that like a winter break um um looking at our schedule here so we're still at what i consider the unit six or week week six here external memory. Uh, originally on the schedule, I had like doing a midterm exam next week. Um, I might wait one more week on that. I'm thinking about waiting one more week on that because I, I don't know if I'm ready to, to, to get that together here. We can talk more about that. So probably next week, we're definitely going to be doing the uh, chapter seven um, on input output. Um, and um, and then I'll probably talk, get do a little bit more time to come up with a bit of a midterm revision. My 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 um, my intention right now for the midterm exam again. I don't want. I'm going to try not to stress out people too much. Um, I'm hoping the quizzes work fine. And most most everybody is you know is doing all the quizzes and and within an, within two or three attempts at least, if not on the first one, manages to get pretty much all of them or nine out of 10 at least. So, uh, which is fine, you know. Um, for the midterm, I'll probably uh, reuse some of those multiple choice, true, false, and short answer questions, but I'll probably add in some, um, some actual written questions, which I'm going to give you some examples from the uh, comprehensive exam so you can get some practice on the comprehensive exam on those. So for our midterm and our final, um, it'll be a mix of what you've been doing for the quizzes, but um, also with some longer questions. Although I'll probably make it a take home again without, without really a time limit, which would be a little bit different from your comprehensive exam questions where you have a definite time limit. So you have to sit down for the exams for, uh, you get usually 20 minutes per question and there, there'd be like five questions you have to answer. So you usually get about like a hundred minutes total where we try to, where we budget about 20 minutes for each one. So, um, but yeah, but that, that's kind of my intention for those, for these exams. So it'd be similar to the quizzes, but with an extra question or two to try and give some practice for things that you might see on the, uh, the written comprehensive exams. So, and I probably, you know, again, also to take off a little bit of the pressure, I, I won't, you know, I, I won't make those um, written questions um, uh, be, a big portion of the test. So maybe I'll make those like a quarter or a third of the points for the for the midterm exam, something like that. So, so it's still kind of multiple choice, true, false. Um, all right. Anyway, that's, that's kind of my intention here. But, but yeah, I'm probably not going to do that next week. I'm probably going to move the midterm exam back one week and we'll do the IO chapter next week. Uh, and then do the midterm exam after that. I'm, I'm thinking about maybe doing the midterm exam and also during doing operating systems together. Um, and then maybe really not having a quiz on operating systems because the operating systems chapter is, 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 
is kind of, you know, just a, um, it, it's a complete overlap with the operating systems course. So it's a, it's a real quick, uh, if you look at the materials on the chapter, it's, it's basically um, materials from his operating system, Stallings operating systems book uh, picked from, you know, the, the highlights of the operating systems course. So, um, so I might, might go over that chapter a little bit quicker than usual, assuming that you would do that stuff again or mostly in the operating systems course. Um, and kind of combine that and then instead of having a quiz, maybe having the midterm exam then. So. Um, all right, so yeah, I, I kind of, any questions on content um, or things going ahead here before I talk a little bit about um, our, this, this week's materials here? Uh, okay. So yeah, I, I, I probably said this before, but um, um, we probably won't spend a whole lot here tonight um, uh, because uh, I don't have a whole lot to say or to add on to this chapter. Hopefully everybody's read it. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so oh, I posted something. I don't know if everybody's, I've been, you know, I've been kind of fascinated by watching the new Mars Lander. Um, but yeah, it was kind of interesting seeing that they're actually using some off the shelf um, stuff that we talked about, like a Qualcomm um, Snapdragon processor uh, and, and Linux. Uh, actually, that that's the, um, the, uh, the, the drone helicopter, apparently. So they're still using a proprietary operating system for the um, actual rover. Um, but, um, but, but yeah, they're, um, from my understanding, they're, they're, um, uh, the, um, the drone is really just a, it's not a, it's not an actual, um, science gathering thing. It's more of a, a you know, a, a test of the, of the engineering and, and, and the systems and things. So kind of a demonstration. So they were a little bit looser on pulling off, off the shelf stuff, but, but, uh, again, it's kind of, kind of neat seeing that. Uh, stuff out there. Um, not to mention, also they have like a. You can actually go to the repository and look at. Um, um, it's actually um, when I dug in this further, it's 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 not a repository of the the drone code specifically. It's more of a um, of, of a framework that they've used for other kinds of space flight projects, so like CubeSats and stuff like that. But um, they adapted the framework then also for their uh, drone operations for the the um, the Perseverance uh, drone. Um, can't remember what they called the helicopter. The, the drone uh, had a name um, separate from the the rover. But anyway, I've, I've been kind of having fun watching the that. There's at least one fun thing out of <laughs> out of all the misery last week for me. Anyway, so. Okay, um, unless there's some questions, let's go ahead and kind of run through these things, see if anybody had any um, stuff they want to know more about on chapter six. Um, so yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm probably not going to talk a lot about the solid state drives or the magnetic tape or the optical memory, you know, so we've, we've, we've most of the solid state drive material we've kind of covered already um, on our previous um, chapter and chapters, um, and and uh, I kind of expect most people are familiar with the general outlines of the magnetic disk technologies. Maybe, maybe not all the details. Um, so I'm probably I, I expect maybe people are less familiar with RAID and how that works. So I want to talk. Maybe add a few things on about that. It's not that I'm a big expert on it, but. Um, um, if you go out and ever have to work with you know big real servers and stuff, they'll normally be using RAID arrays for the uh, for the main uh, disk storage um, for your servers and stuff. So it's a good good to know about kind of how that works and how it relates to external memory drive technologies. Um, um, everybody can see the. Hopefully, I got my sh my screen shared here. I think I got it. Yeah, looks like it. 
Um, all right, so before I jump into magnetic disks, um, so a bit of context, we are talking about external memory this week in this chapter. So, you know, you, you, should, you should kind of have an idea of what we mean by this boundary or this difference between internal memory um, versus external memory. Oh, I see I got a, a typo there. I meant external memory. So in, internal memory is um, usually non-volatile. So there's kind of two things on this boundary. So, so the biggest thing is that really internal memory is, is kind of defined by the architecture of the computing system. So it's part, part of the computing system architecture. So the, the instruction set architecture defines uh, the memory address space, basically. And, and um, the, the, that memory address space that's directly addressable by the defined instruction set architecture, that's usually what we think of as internal memory, right? And that maps basically to RAM, um, so, so main memory or, or primary memory, and, and then the caches in order to, um, you know, in, in order to um, um, get the necessary performance that we need that we talked a lot about, uh, uh, not last week, but the week before last week, before we got interrupted here. So, um, so that's kind of one of the, the things that makes the big dividing line between ex internal versus that should be external memory here. Uh, and the other though, is that typically internal memory, just because of the way the technologies work that we use, uh, internal memory, we mostly think of as being volatile, right? So we've talked about that. I mean, there are semiconductor memories that are non-volatile, uh, like ROM and, and um, vari variations of ROM, um, like uh, um, that, that we talked a little bit about last week. But um, for the most part, you know, we, we think of our internal memory or the primary memory as, as a type of volatile memory. Uh, which, which basically means that, that, you know, it doesn't store it permanently. It, it only keeps the data as long as you keep power um, applied to the uh, memory. So, um, so you can contrast that with this, with this boundary between uh, internal and external memory. Um, so external memory is, is really not accessed as part of the memory address space. Uh, and in fact, you know, external memory drives um, and, and other things that we talked a little bit about here this, in this chapter um, are really IO devices, right? So, so they're, they're accessed indirectly. Um, so typically for external memory, we, we have an abstraction, the file system abstraction um, that we'll probably talk a little bit about in this class later on. Um, that that gives a way to you know think about and organize all the data that's on the external memory devices in such a way that we can you know reference it and then load it into internal memory. So so normally we we organize things as files um, and we load those into memory um, either files of of our programs to be executed or files of the data. That we want to um, that, that we want to do some calculations with, and, and the, we'll, we'll load that into internal memory um, as a first step before we start running the programs and start doing calculations with our data. Right. Um, so yeah, external memory is typically um, uh, non-volatile, so it, um, it will. Um, keep the data, well, I mean, I shouldn't say permanent, you know, not forever, but for much longer than, than volatile memory, than, than RAM, um, when, when power, when, even when you don't have power continuously uh, to your devices. Um, and, and, and yeah, so it's usually, it's not really, this part of the memory hierarchy, um, it, it's really implemented as what we would think as, as I.O. devices, which we'll look at in more detail in our next chapter. Um, so we don't conceive of the data in external memory as part of the addressable memory space, right? So, so we, we access it and organize it through um, 
through a different um, sort of um, abstraction. So typically the file system abstraction when we're, when we're talking about hard drives and external memory. Um, all right, so with that, I mean, you know, there's really only a couple of I.O. devices that we typically use for external memory, you know, that, that, we, that we would think of as, as extending the memory hierarchy of a computer architecture. So those are magnetic disks and optical disks, and then uh, relatively recently, you know, we, we've had the solid state drives, which are a type of um, semiconductor uh, devices, but that are being used that, that, that are non volatile and can be used um, as external memory devices like my like drive, right? Um, so, I mean, I assume most graduate computer science students will, will be familiar with kind of at least the basics of how. Magnet, how, how magnetic uh, drives and other sort of rotating media work, right? Even even if you've never it, it, even if you've never read or studied the the, the nitty gritty details, you, you know some of these um, things about how this all works, right? Um, so you know, ma magnetic drives are still currently the the most common form of external memory storage, right? So they still beat out solid state drives on price. So, so there's still the cheaper option. So we need large amounts of um, external um, hard drive space, uh, you're probably going to be still using magnetic media. But again, that's rapidly changing, you know, so, so the, the solid state drive prices are going down. Um, you know, so at some point they're not, I mean, solid state drives, um, if you, you know, as, as we'll talk about, do beat magnetic drives on performance characteristics. So the, the IO um, speeds that you can attain with them, right? So they're superior on, on a lot of performance characteristics, but they're a bit more expensive on, um, on cost per bit. So, but as solid state drives continue to um, improve, you know, I kind of expect that they're going to get closer and closer and maybe at some point, um, you know, uh, surpass magnetic drives on cost as well, at which point, you know, you'll see pretty much the um, magnetic drives being only used for special purpose kinds of reasons and, and, and solid state drives being the norm for external storage for, for most applications. So, you know, nowadays, you know, as, as you probably all know, I mean, for your phones, and for your like tablets um, and even in your laptops where, um, um, where the, uh, the, the issues of speed and performance um, are a little bit more important and other things, I guess I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but solid state drives also are, you know, that they, they use less power um, they, they tend to, to generate less heat. So all of those, for all those reasons, your, your phones and things don't have magnetic drives that they're, they're going to be using solid state drives, you know, um, memory for the external uh, memory. So, but, you know, at this point, 2021, uh, magnetic drives are still um, the, the most common form of external memory, at least in servers and desktop computers because of price issues. Um, magnetic drives and optical drives are a type of, of um, physical medium that rotates, right? So, so uh, a magnetic drive disk is a circular platter. Um, the, the, you know, the base material of the platter is constructed of non-magnetic material called the substrate. Um, and then usually there's some sort of coating of, of a magnetic uh, media on the platter. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, if you look at the, um, the um, 
the illustrations in our um, chapter six here. Basically, you know, I won't go into the details of the electronics, but you know, basically, your read-write head um, can be manipulated in such a way to turn to 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 switch the the magnetization of of a small area on the platter of this magnetic media so that so that if if north south is in one direction you interpret that as a binary bit of like a zero for example and if it's in the other direction you you would interpret that as a one right so from that basic idea you can you can store bits and and these this this storage is stable so even if power goes away this magnetic you know this direction of the magnetization uh, will remain stable for long periods of time um, without power or anything. So you can come back and then and then and then basically, as our textbook talks about, you know the the same electronic circuitry can be used both to do writing and reading for the most part, or, or some devices use use the same head. Uh, just, just you use a little bit more power in order to change that polarity of the magnetization um, to flip it if you want new, need to do a write, and then you just use it in like a less powerful mode uh, if, if you want to just kind of detect which way that is pointing in order to read the bit back out. So, um, But so I guess as the book talks about um, in newer uh, magnetic drives, often the, the right head is separate from the read head. So you use a slightly different um, technology or a different electronic circuit for doing the reading from the writing. So, um, but you can do that kind of either way. Um, so it's, I think I think older magnetic drives, they, they usually combine the reading and the writing on a single head, but newer drives tend to have separate mechanisms for writing and, and for reading. So, um, so, so yeah, in traditional disks, um, the, the same head was used for writing and reading, and in, in newer ones, though, they're, they're kind of separating that. Um, usually, so. Um, so these platters are usually stacked, right? And um, so, yeah, I made a couple things here. I'll just kind of jump around. So again, I, I, I assume probably a lot of you are familiar, uh, even if you've never read about this stuff, probably know a little bit of some of these details. Um, so typically for fixed hard drives, there's going to be multiple platters. Um, often for these magnetic drives, the, 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 um, the substrate, sub, substrate is going to be um, in, coded on the top and the bottom. So there'll be a dual um, substrate, right? So, so, so um, you can have, um, you can read and write bits on both the top and the bottom of these platters. Um, as this figure, um, implies then you'll have a read head one per each of the the the, the platter substrate so so if you have a dual substrate you're going to have to have a read head on the top and the bottom um typically for these if this this read write head uh, will be movable so you'll have to move it in and out to, to position it over a particular track that you might want to read from right um, I think newer disks, um, um, you'll have actually multiple heads, multiple read heads, one over every track, right? Uh, but, but of course, as you can imagine, that would be more expensive. Um, but, but yeah, th this is more of um, the, the traditional hard drives. There was only one of these heads uh, over each of the substrats, and then, then the head would be moved. So that, that was known as the seek. So, so this head would have to seek to the particular track um, that you would want to read or write data from, right? Um, and you know anybody that's that's even I mean you know still um, hard drives today you, you'll hear them when they're doing this kind of stuff making particular noises as they seek 
um, and, you know, as they move the head to or from the, the center to the, to the outer edges. So, um, I'm not 100% certain. So, so I think some discs, though, have one head over every track. So then, of course, that, that's a big advantage. You don't have to actually seek. You've got a head over every track that you would need. So you would eliminate the, the, the seek time. But, um, you know, so, so this is a mechanical thing. So, of course, these are all trade-offs. So if you only have one head, you have to actually have a mechanical thing to move this. Um, and that mechanic takes time and it could break, right? But if you have multiple heads, uh, you, you've got, um, you know, one over every track, potentially, uh, you don't have any of that movement that you would need, only, only the, the, the platter would have to rotate. Um, but, um, but you have more complex electronics, you know, you have a lot more heads, you have to, to have, have, have more things built in on how you select the head that you need and, and things like that. So those are the kinds of trade-offs that, that, that you would see here. Um, of course, these, these heads are really rel very small, you know, so, um, I mean, as you can imagine, the, the, in order to ring the, the most performance, you need to try and get the, the, the density of the data that you can read and write as small as possible. So that implies that you have to have these heads be quite small so that so the, the, the area that you're reading um, on your magnetic medium is as small as possible. So you, so you can pack as many bits as possible um, um, uh, onto your tracks here. Um, okay, continuing on. So, so, you know, this is all standard terminology. So, so the, the, there'll be multiple concentric tracks um, on your my, on your rotating medium, right? So typically there's a few 10 or 20 or 30 of these tracks um, along the medium, depending on your drive. Each track is, is going to be divided into sectors. Um, and, and basically, you know, it's, it's pretty much um, standardized onto a sector is basically a 512 bytes in size, right? So, so each of these sectors, each of these blocks, has a half of a kilobyte or 512 bytes on there, where a byte is eight bits here. So. Typically, you can fit you know hundreds of these sectors on one track. Um, so for contemporary drives, um, Normally, we just fit the same number of sectors on a track, no matter. You know, so notice there's a lot less linear area on an inner track than there is on an outer track. So um, the simplest thing to do is just to, to use the same number of sectors on each track, no matter if you're on, on the inner or the outer. But that implies, so if you, if you divide these into the same number of tracks, you have to use uh, a constant angular velocity. So that implies that you're going to put more space between your bits on the outside, on these outside tracks. Um, and, and you have to put less space in between there in order to maintain a constant read speed or a constant angular velocity, right? Um, So, I mean, that has some disadvantages. I mean, in theory, you, you could get a lot more information if you didn't maintain that, that, that constant um, size for your sectors, right? So um, I, I don't know how, I don't know enough about hard drives to know um, whether it's more common to just use, to divide into equal number sectors on each track or to use this multiple zone recording. So this idea is that um, you might want to change the number of sectors, you know, increase that in some increment as you get further and further away from the center. Um, because, you know, of course, you can support that uh, with the same read head. Um, 
All right, so, so for, for this, we're using the constant angular velocity. Your density is gonna be, um, is gonna be constrained by how dense you can make it on the very smallest, the very inner uh, track of your medium here, right? Here, um, whatever density you can get here, you can um, then uh, use that same density or kind of um, similar, uh, but increase the number of sectors that you have on the tracks as you get to larger and larger or further away from the center here. So, um, so yeah, uh, again, I, I don't know how, how common it is to use the, the multiple zone versus the constant angular velocity. This is simpler. Um, but you lose a little bit of the, the ability to um, um, get as much data as possible onto your disk platters here. This is more complex, so you're going you're to have to change your read-write speeds depending on which zone that you're in here. So, um, but um, um, with the trade-off that, that, yeah, that you can pack more data in there if you do that. So. So yeah, I, I don't know how common it is to use this MZR versus the the, the CAV on, on modern um, magnetic hard drives. Um, so let's see. I think we kind of cover all of these, most all of these. Um, you can, you can uh, another common term is, is a cylinder. So since, uh, oh, I, I forgot to mention. So as far as I know, for all hard drives, even if you have multiple um, heads like this for a movable, uh, they still, they, they, these don't move independently usually. So there's only one mechanism to move. So all of these will move to the same track, right? Or, um, so whatever platter they're over, they'll be over the same track relative to the you know, inner or outer edge here. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there is the, the um, in theory, since there's multiple read-write heads, even if you're using a movable arm, that you could be reading or writing data in parallel um, over the, each of these platters. And that's kind of where the cylinder would be important. Um, um, so I, I don't know if a lot of things make, take advantage of that, but, um, but yeah, in theory, um, if you're reading or writing data over, different tops and bottoms of these platters on the same track within the same cylinder, uh, you could be doing that in parallel. Um, but, um, but again, that, that gets kind of complex to manage those sorts of things. So it's probably not very common to do things like that. Um, So one final thing here, uh, we've talked before. Uh, so last week when we talked about internal memory, we noted that there are error correction. Um, so error detection and error correction mechanisms built into uh, the internal semiconductor memory. Um, so the same thing applies, not exactly the same thing, but, but there are um, error detection mechanisms built in um, as well on, on hard drives. So typically, you know, so, so they showed one example in our chapter six here of a particular Winchester drive. So for a sector with uh, 512 bytes of data, um, there's um, in this particular disk, there's actually 600 bytes. Some of those bytes are um, um, ID fields and sync fields, right? So as you're as you're rotating the drive around, 
um, these heads basically in order to figure out where they are, so which sector they're currently over, they'll be detecting um, as the stuff passes below them, these, um, these uh, ID fields and the sync bytes and these sync fields, right? So, so they'll use that kind of information to, to see which sector they're currently over um, and, you know, to keep track of which sector they're going to be coming up on. So, so those represent a bit of overhead that you need to keep um, on here. Uh, but another type of overhead is the, um, so, you know, besides these ID fields and, and these, these synchronizations, you also have these CRC, the, these um, um, check um, um, calculations, right? So these, these can be used for error detection, both on the ID and also on the data. Um, so, so there'll usually be some, some check bits or check bytes um, stored with your data and also with your um, IDs. Um, again, mostly from my understanding from reading this is these are mostly just used for error detection. So you, you can detect if data or um, or uh, um, a sector has become corrupt by by calculating the CRCs and, and and ensuring whether they match or not. Okay. Um, But um, if I if I read this right or if I understand this right, um, typically hard drives are reliable enough. Um, that, so this this might not be true for solid state drives, but my, magnetic drives are reliable enough that that they often don't do the error correction; they just do error detection to try and keep track of whether a sector is good or has gone bad or not. Right. Um, and then kind of error correction is left for um, RAID for, for the, um, the, the next section that we'll talk about here. Um, so uh, a slightly higher level abstraction for the, uh, the external memory uh, devices. So. Um, Okay, let's see here. So I think we covered the important things here. Um, so, and, and you know, we've, we've brushed on most of these. Um, so this is just kind of a summary of, of some of the, the characteristics or the trade-offs that you might see in a physical, so, so these, these kinds of things apply both to magnetic and also optical medium. So anytime we're talking about rotating medium, you know, you know we've got these different things like the head mo motion. So whether it's a fixed head versus a movable head, um, um, whether it's removable versus non-removable media. So most of these magnetic hard drives I'm talking about here um, are, we think of as non-removable. So, you know, um, magnetic removable medium are, have pretty much um, disappeared from common usage. So floppy drives or zip drives, right? So most removable medium, so and even CDs and DVDs use an optical, but removable medium are, are really not common nowadays, even in desktop systems. So, so most removable medium, has, has pretty much evolved to flash, you know, to, to semiconductor um, solid state technology at this point. So, um, single versus double sided. I don't know if they still do. What's that? A lot of the major, the major corporations might be using them for backup. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, it's the old you still fine. Yeah. I mean, I still, I've still got like a DVD on my. Um, desktop system, but um, but yeah, newer ones that you buy tend not to have them, or well, certainly not laptops. Or kind of the DVDs are going away, but the uh, probably yeah, still get not. I'm talking about the big corporations and their servers and stuff. The yeah. backups sometimes they'll use tape backups and sure. ship them off site. Right. Um, 
and yeah. to keep it from in the internet they don't trust the internet to send their data sometimes so they they'll do it that way like yeah. Iron mountain and stuff right right that's a good point and then yeah if you guys have read you know the the uh, the, the tape backup is, is a, maybe a bit surprising that, that you may not know about this, but yeah, for big data systems, magnetic tape is still used a lot because it can, it can get so much on it. So for like offline backup storage, um, um, you know, when you need terabytes of backup stuff, um, they'll, they'll be using a lot of tape for things like that. So. But, but yeah, typical, you know, um, personal computer users, you know, probably are mostly using, you know, flash drives at most for your removable media. If, if you want to pull something off of one system and, and walk it over to another system, so you probably got your flash drive nowadays. Um, um, obviously, I mean, so a lot of removable media is really just single platter, although um, often stuff is double sided. Right, but the hard drives are usually multiple platter. They have multiple of these rotating platters in them. Um, obviously, if, if you can coat on both sides, you can double your potential um, amount of data storage. So, you know, modern stuff is all going to be double sided um, if you have a, a platter. So, you'd be using both sides of the platter if at all possible. Um, yeah, and I don't know a whole lot about, you know, so there's all kinds of different head mechanisms and, and things. Um, so apparently uh, the old floppy drives, the, the head would actually contact, the, you know, your physical um, floppy drive platter as it rotated around. Um, it's pretty dangerous because, of course, that could um, dig into it. So one of the, so for hard drives, it used to be a pretty big problem, even though that there were gap systems that a little bit of jiggle could cause the head to plow down into the platter, and that would cause physical damage to the drive. So um, I don't think they're, they're, you know, newer technologies, I think, um, aren't quite as susceptible to that type of um, crash of the head into the physical medium as, it, as they used to be. So. Um, yeah, I, um, I thought, I mean, I, I would encourage you to make certain that you kind of understand, can, can, can um, calculate these sorts of transfer times um, um, as is shown some from these examples here in the um, um, the this performance parameters here so I thought I might work through uh, this kind of quickly here just just to make certain that, that you understand where these numbers come from so these numbers make sense if, if you correctly I mean the, the, the most difficult thing is to make certain that you're using the right units of time and some things like that right um so let me see here um So hopefully you guys can see that. I was going to, I was going to maybe try and um, uh, work through these a little bit. Maybe not take too long here. Um, but um, but yeah, for example, if if um, just looking at, at their uh, example that they talked about here. Um, of course, so so if you want to if you want to calculate the the total time that's going to take to transfer a piece of data from a rotating magnetic media or, or rotating media like this, um, I mean th this. Um, um, oh, yeah, don't 
um, the the if you have the notes in front of you, you know you, you basically have to add up three pieces of information. Um, the um, let me go back to this real quickly. So um, you know you have to add up the the your total total time is going to depend on the seek time plus the this second term here refers to the amount of time um, that you need to wait. So this is the rotational. Uh, this is a calculation for the rotational delay, basically. Um, and, and usually both of these, we, we think of these in terms of average, right? So, so the actual seek time is going to depend on how, if, if you do have to do a seek, so if you've got a movable arm, um, and if you're at the inside track zero and you have to seek all the way to the outside track, whatever, 30, that's going to be the maximal you know, that's going to take the maximum amount of seek time. But on average, you usually have to, to seek over about half of the tracks wherever you're at. So that, that's usually what we use for this, um, the average seek time. The same thing for the rotation, right? So, so um, once you get to the track where you want to read or write your data onto, you have to wait for the particular sector to rotate around, right? So on the worst case, you might have ended up finishing your seek right when the sector you wanted just passed underneath. So you have to wait for a whole rotation, right? And on the best case, you might end up, your seek comes and, um, and the, 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 um, the sector you want comes up immediately when you're done with your seek, right? But on average, you're gonna have to go to about a half of a rotation for your seek. And that's kind of where the one over two here comes from. And the reason why the R is on the bottom is because the rotation speed is in terms of revolutions per second. So this is this is revolutions over seconds. And then so if, if you do that, one half times that is going to be the calculation in terms of of seconds or you know whatever the time is, right? Um, and then the, the last expression is just the, the total transfer time. So the total amount of time to read some number of bytes um, um, from the medium as it's rotating, okay? So, um, so for example, um, if you have a drive that's, um, so, so they give an example drive with these characteristics. Um, we're given that, um, well, we're just given that the average seek time is four milliseconds, right? So, so, so we know, you know, we're trying to calculate the T total, where we're given that the, the time seek is just four milliseconds, the average seek time. So that means that normally, you know, a normal seek is going to have, you're going to have to seek over about half of the tracks. Um, so it takes four milliseconds to reposition the head. So, so we're, we're using some sort of a movable um, medium here and, and, and we have to go four milliseconds normally to go over about half the tracks, basically. So that, that's, that's our seek time. Um, and then, um, We're given um, that we have a rotation speed of 1500 revolutions per minute. So 1500 RPMs. So that's per minute. So you have to divide that by 60 first to get revolutions per second. Um, so if you divide that by 60, you get. Um, that, that, that that's equal to 250 uh, revolutions per second. Um, and since we're, we're using everything, this is kind of where you have to be careful about, um, about the unit. So since we're using milliseconds, we should probably specify everything either in seconds or milliseconds. So, so if we specify this in terms of milliseconds, um, that's telling us that, uh, so milliseconds is one one thousandth of a second. So that, that gives us a, um, uh, 250 divided by a thousand, or a um, a 0.25 uh, revolutions per uh, millisecond. 
right? So what that means basically is that um, we, we revolve, the, the, the disk revolves one quarter of the disk every millisecond. So every one one thousandth of a second, um, one quarter of the disk. So, so that implies that in order to get a full rotation, um, So, so this, this is 0.25 uh, revolutions per millisecond. So to get one full rotation um, takes four milliseconds, right? So one millisecond, we get one quarter. So in four milliseconds times, we get uh, one full rotation. All right. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to jump back and forth between our notes and stuff, but basically what that means that on average, the average rotational delay is going to be about half of that, right? So again, you could get lucky and, and when you stop your seek, you're right at the block that you want to read, the, the sector you want to read, and you, you have no rotational delay, you start reading immediately, or you could get unlucky and you are just past the sector, so you have to wait for a full, mo a full four milliseconds. But on, on average, um, you have to rate about half that time. So that's where this, um, you know, the, the one half R, you know, if, if you plug in the 0.25, comes up with that, that the, the average rotational delay ends up being two milliseconds. Um, uh, if, if you plug in those numbers there, right? Um, and then in, in, our, in this example from the textbook, basically it's given an example of reading lots of data. So reading all of the sectors um, on five tracks where each track has 500 sector, sectors or reading 250 sectors total, right? But to read a single sector, um, so the, 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 the last part, so if I wanted to read or if, so if I wanted to read all of the sectors on one track, that would be 500 sectors. Um, so that would be like 500 times um, the, the number of bytes uh, per sector. So 500 times 5,112 divided by the rotational speed, which is the 0.25 um, revolutions per millisecond times the, the number, the, the big N, the number of bytes on a track, which is again, 500 times 5,112. So those, those, those cancel out there. So you just, again, you end up with just over the one, one over the 0.25, or that gives you the, the, the total time of four milliseconds to read, um, all of the sectors on one track. So again, if you look back at the notes, or actually not the, if, if you look back at our textbook, you know, it, it gives out four milliseconds to read 500 seconds. And, and again, that should make sense because, you know, we already said that it takes four milliseconds for the drive to rotate completely one time. So if all of the data you want to read is in, is in the, the sectors on that track, you can read all that data in all the sectors on one track in one rotation or four milliseconds, okay? So, um, so basically that's, that's where, the, the, so the total time to read all of the data in one track would be, would be this, it would, would be the four plus two plus four or 10 milliseconds, right? Um, If you read further on in the textbook, then the, what, what they're talking about is reading not the data just from one track, but reading the data then from four tracks that are adjacent. So all, all four of these tracks with all 500 sectors on the tracks are all together. So that means to read the four subsequent tra tracks, there, you really don't need any seek time. So the seek time is zero. Um, and um, but they do imply that that you still need to, um, to 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 wait for an average rotational delay before you can start reading, right? So that's where the the four times six comes into. So so you have ten milliseconds 
to, to seek and then wait and then read the first track. And then after that, there's no more seek times. So to read the, 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 the additional four tracks, you'd have four times just, um, you have to, you still have to do, um, um, wait for the rotation to occur on average to get to the beginning of the sector that you want to read to, and then four milliseconds. So, so you get four times six or 24. So, um, so they, anyway, they, they come up, came up with 34 milliseconds and that's, that's where this, this calculation came from um, uh, in this particular example. So that allows us to read all five tracks of 500 sectors of, of data, um, which is equivalent to a 1.28 megabyte, megabyte um, data transfer here. And, and again, this is all assuming that, that the data is on five contiguous tracks. So it's all compactly um, placed onto five tracks that are all together here. Right? Um, But, and then I won't go into um, uh, quite as much detail here, but com compare that to, you know, if we have to do five, if, if we have to read all of those. So, so here we've got 2,500 sectors we want to read, but in, instead of being all um, compacted together um, onto some contiguous tracks, imagine that they're all randomly um, scattered throughout the hard drive here, right? So in that case, um, for every one of these 2,500 sectors, we have to do an average seek um, and an average rotation and then just read one sector. So reading one sector instead of reading all 500 sectors takes the one over the um, 0.25. So so that comes out to 0 0.08 milliseconds to read all of just one sector, right? So every one of these 2,500 sectors that you want to read uh, would take six, a little bit over six milliseconds, um, which means that, so, so if, if, if you don't defragment your disk and, and get all this together, if you have to skip around randomly for all of these, you know, you go from, um, 34 milliseconds to actually taking about 15 seconds to read that, right? So another point of this calculation is, you know, how um, how much fragmentation or how much skipping around on your drive can affect your performance, right? So if you if you got all of your data nicely um, organized together so that you can read sequentially um, as the platter um, passes underneath the rig head, um, you can get that same amount of data relatively quickly. But if, if it's fragmented and spread all throughout the hard drive, uh, I mean, this is, you know, not 15 times longer, but it's, it's um, um, you know, 15,000 times longer, basically, because of, of the way um, things work here. So. So yeah, I mean, you know, that conclusion, hopefully, hopefully you've kind of followed that um, in general here. I mean, the, these numbers do make sense if you sit down and if you get your units of time correct um, and, and think about them. So, but uh, this, this illustrates in general, kind of the, the, the timing for reading data from a rotating um, drive um, and it also, illustrates the, the, the tremendous effect on IO performance that fragmentation can have, so. Okay. Um, so I think that was all kind of that I wanted to say about the magnetic drives. Um, so unless there's any questions, let's go ahead and move on to 
uh, raid here. They're stuck by video here. Um, Hopefully, I got my screen shared correctly. I got it right. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about RAID. Um, so, RAID stands for uh, Redundant Array of Independent uh, Disks. So, this is a pretty common, um, I don't know what to call it, a, it's a pretty common standard. Um, so you'll find, so, so it's pretty easy to find hardware-based controllers um, so that you can create a, a, a RAID array of disks for your, um, usually for your you know, desktop or server system. So you know, typically uh, for your own laptop, or personal computer, you might not be using RAID, but so this is more important again as you get to big servers and things. Um, so RAID um, can actually be used to improve both I/O performance, um, and it can also be used to improve um, reliability. Um, so so to to guard against. Uh, data loss um, if you have drive failures, right? Um, basically, um, this is done by using striping and using various kinds of redundancy. Um, so if, if you have multiple drives, um, one way to include to the, the, the basic way, to increase I/O performance is to what's known as stripe the the the, the data or, or stripe your um, accesses over the multiple drives in the array. Okay, so so the the intuitively, I hope you see how that helps. That can potentially help with performance because if we need to do I/O operations and if the I/O operations are happen to be on stripes. Uh, that are on different drives, I can potentially be reading or writing those data in parallel on the different drives on the array. Okay, so that, that that's the basic way that performance for RAID can be enhanced is this kind of striping. Okay? So the, the main difference between the RAID um, like two and two and three striping and the RAID uh, four, five, six striping is that uh, the, the, the two and three striping is done on much smaller um, stripes. And in fact, it's done down to like um, the, 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 the byte level or, or word level is the stripe for the RAID two and three, where, uh, and, and two, RAID two and three isn't used a lot typically, so, so it's, it's, it's really a special case kind of stuff. So it's more typical to use RAID 5 or, or to use RAID 4, 5, or 6, right? So here the striping is done on a block level or, or like a sector level, uh, so bigger units basically. Um, but then um, the other thing that RAID gives you is um, to increase reliability. And the way that's done is to add redundancy into the, the array of, of, of drives, OK? So we, we trade off some overhead to have some redundant information in order to increase reliability. And, then, and so, so, like I said, from my understanding, most drives, they, they don't do error correction. They just do error detection. So they, they can tell if a block has gone bad by doing the, the, using the CRC uh, checksums to, to check if um, there's some sort of a, a parity um, error, right? But you, you can get um, 
data uh, error recovery on the RAID level from this redundancy, right? So the simplest way this is done is what's known as um, um, RAID 1. So this is just simple mirroring, okay? Um, so here, the, the redundancy is that if we have an array of drives, so I guess in this illustration, there's kind of like eight drives in the array, but we basically mirror. So every block or every um, stripe um, is mirrored um, in two places, um, on one drive and not on another. So, so you have simple mirroring, okay? So that, that's, that's easy to understand, right? So um, even if we lose one drive, um, we can always just replace that drive with a new one, and then we can copy over the, the, the mirror data um, from our mirror drive to the new one once we replace the failed drive, right? So that, that's how we do error correction in this kind of rate mirroring, okay? And, and rate zero, um, Potentially, you know, as long as you don't lose the same two drives that have the, the mirrored stripes, you know, so I could I could lose this drive um, and still keep going and then lose this mirrored drive and still keep going. Right. So if you get if you could get if you get lucky, you can potentially lose more than one drive on RAID 1 mirroring. Um, but of course, it's not it's, it's um, um, not safe to rely on that. So, so as soon as you lose one drive, you should normally get it out and, and replace it um, and um, um, recopy your mirror data as fast as possible um, to get your RAID back up to full um, redundancy. Um, That's basically what RAID 1 is. RAID 0 doesn't really use, so um, our textbook even says, you know, RAID 0 is not really a type of, of RAID because it doesn't have any redundancy. So for RAID 0, you're using the striping to, to increase performance, but since there's no redundancy, you have no um, error correction or error recovery abilities with a RAID 0, right? Um, and in fact, you know, because you have multiple drives, when you have multiple drives in, in an array, in an array of drives, you're increasing your chances that one of these is going to fail. So you're actually increasing your chances that you're going to have a non-recoverable um, data um, if you're using RAID 0, right? So, so, so RAID 0 only helps for to try and increase performance. With the striping, but but you're you're trading that off by making it more likely you have uh, data loss when one of these drives fails on you in, in your array. So. Uh, but yeah, RAID, RAID zero is used in like high performance computing, right? So as long as you back up um, these drives to some other um, backup system. Um, you, you can increase your performance by just using striping, um, but not using any redundancy. So. Um, but yeah, the, the most common use of RAID is, is a four, five, or six. And I think five is the most used, right? So, so four, five, and six all use redundancy at a block level. So the, the main difference between four and five is that four, we just use one drive to keep a, a parity. So this is basically the same as the error correction that we talked about um, um, for the internal memory, okay? So if, if one of these drives go out um, or, or if your parity drive goes out, you can still replace that. So if, if one of these drives goes out, um, you can, you can um, replace it from the information from the existing drives um, and this parity information that's saved on the parity drive, right? Um, the main drawback for the RAID 4 is that the, the, the parity drive becomes a, a bottleneck, um, as, as our text discusses, because every read or, uh, sorry, every, every write, you have to write the, the block in the stripe, but you also have to write the parity uh, information or, or rewrite it. 
So, uh, so that means that for every write, you're going to have to hit your parity drive, making the parity drive become a bit of a bottleneck here. So, so it's more common to use RAID 5 instead of RAID 4. And so that they're, they're basically the same thing, but you distribute the parity uh, blocks over all of the drives in the array. So here, you, you no longer have one drive that has all the parity information. So there, therefore, you have no, no one drive that becomes a bottleneck um, for the writes that you need to do for your RAID array. So, but in both cases, again, if you, if you lose one of these drives, it can be recreated from the existing drives um, and the parity information. You know, so you can recreate all these. So, so typically, um, on a RAID 5 array, um, the, the, if, if you have a, a hardware, so, so you, can, you can implement RAID both in hardware and software. So for a hardware RAID controller, um, it will tell you, you know, you'll be able to determine the health of all the drives in the RAID array, and it will tell you if one of the drives has failed. Um, and then often, usually, you can hot swap these. So you can remove out the, the failed drive, plug in a new clean drive, um, and then it will rebuild that, that, that information for the one failed drive from the uh, non-failed existing drives, okay? Um, but, but RAID 5 can only tolerate a single hard drive failure. Um, if two drives fail before you rebuild the failed one, um, you will end up losing your data at that point. Um, and, and that's... Um, that is not as unlikely to occur as you would like it to, right? So especially if you have a hard drive failure, in order to rebuild the failed drive, you have to do a lot of reading and writing. Um, so it can be, be particularly pernicious that you end up getting a second hard drive failure while you're trying to rebuild um, a failed uh, drive in a RAID 5 array. Um, so anyway, um, I mean, you know, it, it's still unlikely. So, so RAID 5 is, is still used a lot. But on cases where you really need um, high data um, availability, um, you might use a RAID 6, which has dual redundancy. So from my understanding, these basically are just using two different types of, of, um, of, of, of like hamming kinds of code. But, but the, but two different methods to, to, to create two different um, uh, parity uh, blocks here for every um, set of, of block stripes, right? So what that comes down to then is that you can basically, um, if you lose two drives, um, you still have enough information to recover all of, of the, the information, even for a two drive loss, right? So as long as you immediately rebuild your RAID array, when you have one drive failure, you'll be fine. Um, and you can even tolerate it if, if, if you lose a second drive, even in the middle of rebuilding uh, for one lost drive. So only after you've lost three drives um, do you have data loss uh, um, on a RAID array here. Um, all right, so that was kind of really kind of quick, but my high level understanding of, of, of RAID, um, I had a, a link, um, uh, I didn't talk a lot about the, the, um, the, the trade-offs on the performance, um, but uh, the, the link I had might give you a little bit better information if you want a, a more succinct um, breakdown of the advantages and disadvantages of each of these uh, RAID levels. Um, our textbook talked a little bit about those as well. So, you know, I gave a little bit about um, the, the trade-offs between I.O. transfer capacity for large I.O. requests and small I.O. requests. So, so here, the way to think about these is, is this, if, if so, so for, for, for transaction systems, so, so typically most um, like web servers and things have lots of small 
IO transactions. So, so, so most like web servers and, and database servers are kind of look more like small IO request weights that you need to optimize. Um, so, um, so if that's the case, again, you want to use um, this to get, get a feel for um, how it's going to perform. But, but some systems, um, uh, you tend to read or write like a large amount of data. These, are, these tend to be more for like high performance computing systems where you, you need to read one big chunk either into memory or back out to memory at a time. Um, so, so the characteristics look a little bit different for, for that type of the system. So, so that, that's where you might want to use a, um, um, like a, like a, a RAID zero um, or, a, or one of these um, two or three. So. Um, yeah, I mean, mirroring, you know, a RAID one is not used for servers very much. Uh, because you know the the, the it, it has a large um, you know since, since you're mirroring uh, all of your data you have you have to have twice as many hard drives or, or you basically have you know you know, you only have one half of the the storage capacity um, for the number of drives that you put into your array so that's, that's kind of a big that's, that's a big sort of um, disadvantage um, to using that so. so. And um, there's actually more, um, um, like if you look up Wikipedia, um, you see that there's a few more um, that weren't listed in our textbook. Um, actually, most of these are just combinations. Um, so, um, Uh, must not have the right. So those are the standard grade levels. Um, yeah, so you, so you might run across like grade zero one, zero three, or one zero. So really, most of these are just combining. So like one zero is combining a mirrored uh, with a striped. Um, so so there'll be two levels of grade. Okay, so um, in certain special um, Circumstances, um, it can be advantageous to do that kind of stuff. So combining a one zero or a five zero. So, so um, combining a RAID five with a, 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 a zero, a RAID zero striping. So. Um, and I think there might be a defined a RAID seven, but um, uh, Maybe I'm wrong. I thought there was like a newer one past the RAID 0 through 6 and the standard ones that have been defined. Anyway. Um, um, okay, yeah, so I, I think that, that that's kind of everything for the, the, the raid. Um, so I don't know if I made any questions on those things. Uh, so yeah, I'm probably gonna go ahead and um, so there's not too much left here. So like, like I already said, I don't have too much more to add on to um, the optical memory or the, the, the solid state drive. So a lot of this, this information um, um, for the solid state drives, we've already kind of run into before when we talked about flash and, and solid state memory previously, right? So, um, but, but yeah, it is, it is good to be aware that um, solid state drives are kind of replacing 
standard rotating magnetic and optical media um, for external memory. So I, I assume, you know, I, I assume in the server space that um, you know the prices are going to continue to drop per bit for style of safe drives, and then we'll see these becoming more and more. So it's pretty common nowadays for servers to see hybrid systems. So you'll see a solid state drive being used for your boot drive and holding the operating system. Um, and you'll have a, a bigger magnetic drive or, or a big uh, RAID array of drives to hold um, um, a lot of storage for your, um, you know, your hard drive space for external storage. So. Um, optical drives have, have never really been used for um, um, for external. They've, they've never be, really been used for your fixed internal drives. They're, they've mostly been used for removable media, as I'm as you probably know, right? So, so mostly CDs and DVDs um, have evolved. And from my understanding, I mean, you know, the the technology is pretty similar. I mean, most of the, the changes um, has, has um, for, for optical media has just been making the, the, the media more and more dense. So, so things like changing the wavelength of the laser for, for the, the, the media um, and, and using both sides of the medium. And, and I know that there's some things where they've um, done it so that you could focus the laser at different levels. So you can actually get like multiple levels on a single sort of platter, right? So the, the, most of those have been the technology that's, that's been evolving to uh, be able to get more and more data crammed into basically the same size as, as a CD, right? So yeah, the Blu-ray DVDs, I mean, I've never had one of these on my own personal computer. So I mostly had DVDs at most. Um, so, I, um, um, but uh, but yeah, those are up to what being able to support up to twenty five gigabytes on a um, on a uh, on, on a removable, basically DVD sized uh, thing. So, um, oh, somebody had a question, uh, kind of back to the raid about how can um, um, the um, lost data be recovered from this kind of parity information. Um, so yeah, so I didn't go into that into detail. Um, it's, we, we discussed this more um, the, the, the last week when we talked about internal um, memory and when we talked a little bit about Hamming codes. So, so the ideas are basically the same, right? So as, as long as you store enough parity information, you can, recover all of the, the lost uh, bytes on, on one drive from the parity information and the existing um, information for the, the other blocks, right? So, um, so I don't know if that's gonna be satisfying. I, I mean, you know, I, 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 it's, it, it's a similar process to what we talked about for, for, the, for the Hamming codes. Um, um, but, but yeah, the details are going to be a bit different. So basically, you have to have enough redundant information so that you can assume that if I just lose one of these blocks from the other blocks um, and my parity information, I can reconstruct um, the, 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 the missing bytes and the missing blocks, right? So I don't know if that's satisfactory or enough for the for the, the question that was asked, you know, but um, but but yeah, you can do that. Um, and um, and it will look similar to the details about the Hamming codes from the previous chapter that we talked about, right? So um, I mean, but yeah, if you're interested, we could certainly I, I should I could we should probably find some sources. I'm, I'm sure that we could find a source somewhere that would give um, the the details. Uh, in more detail of, of the particular RAID parity. So I'm sure it's, it's, it's kind of gets in, gets pretty complex, but um, um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, optical medium, optical drives have mostly been used for removable mediums as far as I know. Um, 
and then, yeah, we already mentioned magnetic tape. You may not have ever used magnetic tape yourself, but, but they are still used a lot, especially uh, back in server rooms and, and for big data projects. So, so these standards, LTO standards have been continually evolving and they're up to, um, so your typical tape for the LTO eight um, can get 32, gig, 32 terabytes onto a single tape. Um, and notice also that, and this is important as well, that the uh, the, the transfer rate um, continues to um, increase as well. So, it, doesn't, so it, tend, it tends to take about the same amount of time uh, to get to, to fill up one of these tapes, even though the, the capacity has been continually increasing on these magnet, magnetic tapes. Um, but yeah, the 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 uh, you know as is described here, um, the 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 reading and writing is pretty similar to the reading and writing for the magnetic um, drives that we talk about. So it's, it's, it's the same kind of idea where you're using a magnetic medium um, and you're changing the the polarity um, with a head, but. Yeah, instead of platters rotating, it's, it's a tape that you wind around that you have to access serially um, from the beginning to the end of the tape to get any data onto it or off, off of it. So. So yeah, I mean, this, this stuff is pretty cheap per byte um, to, to, to store large amounts of data um, out to tape. All right, um, yeah, so we've already gone well over an hour. Um, I'm kind of losing my voice here. Um, so I'm probably gonna go ahead and um, wrap it up. Uh, were there any kind of other questions or things people wanted to discuss or ask about? All right, so yeah, um, that's probably it for tonight then. I guess enough. So um, as usual, the quiz should be available for this chapter. So make certain that you don't forget that. Um, and yeah, I'll see you next week. We'll talk more about the, um, uh, the midterm test next week um, as I kind of figure out the details of it. Um, but yeah, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, Feel free to email me questions if you have them. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you guys uh, next time. Um, I got a quick question when you stop recording.